things you are here to fulfill. Whatever you choose for a career path, remember the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. Welcome to Today I have on John Hersey, and we are going to talk about all things philosophy. He is very, very uh, intelligent in this topic, and I'm so excited to pick his brain. So welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Okay. So give a little bit of a background on yourself. Um, How did you get into philosophy? Why does it matter to you, et cetera? Yeah, I'll try to keep it brief. It, it is a bit of a long story, but it actually goes back to early childhood. Um, I loved art and still do. Loved movies, loved books, loved music. And I always found myself in one of the things that I was attracted to it for was the ideas. I would latch on to certain ideas in the movies that I would watch or in the books that I would read or even in, in the lyrics of songs that I really liked. And I would attempt to put those ideas into practice in my life. And usually this would last a day, two days, maybe a week. And I had fun pretending that I was all sorts of action heroes. You know, it was what a lot of kids do. But I also took it to a a kind of a different place with testing out the ideas that I'd hear in different places and seeing, okay, well, what would it actually mean to live by this idea? And I'd filter my decisions through those ideas and sort of test them out. And I did this all through childhood. And at some point, I started to look for deeper answers, more universal answers to these questions. And I was actually introduced to uh, reading the Bible at the, the young age of about 16, which is kind of funny. Most people... Uh, if they get interested in religion at, at all, it's much earlier. But um, I got introduced uh, to religion, and I should actually say in, interested in religion pretty late in life because here was a system of answers about how to live and what you ought to do. It didn't take long for me to, in testing out this system, realize that it had some things that were lacking, Um So for one, it called evil, what we think of as evil, it's sort of this otherworldly mystical thing, right? That people largely, you know, are they responsible for it or is it the devil's fault? It's not really clear. Um, And that didn't really gel with my understanding of people's actions, why they take them, and where moral desert, so to speak, lies who deserves what and why. It also didn't, Christianity didn't really leave room for me to live the kind of life that I was seeing in my heroes in uh, fiction and in movies, because here were people who had values and they went after those values with gusto. They lived life to the fullest. And I was looking at Christianity and it was telling me to, to really give up my values and to think about how I might serve other people. So in time, I became disillusioned with Christianity and I picked up another book and this one was on Buddhism. And I was reading about the Eightfold Path. This was about 17 years old. And that didn't take very long either, having already seen this pattern with Christianity to, uh, again, see exactly the same thing. Here's this system of ideas that is essentially telling me, renounce your values and don't think too much about how to achieve them in life. And so it was around this time that I was looking for money for college, and I came across a scholarship essay contest. And it was the, the most amount of money you could get out of any scholarship essay contest. It was something like $50,000. So I was like, this is one I have to do. So I went down to the bookstore and I said, you know, I'm going to find this book. It's called Atlas Shrugged by this guy named Ayn Rand. And I think I asked somebody that was working at the store about this and they sort of like smirked. And, uh, and so I pick up the book and I start reading it and I'm immediately hooked. And um, maybe 15 or 20 pages in, I just can't put the thing down. And I think I read it in about three weeks, which 
there are people who, who have read it a lot faster. It's about uh, just under 1,200 pages, like 1,168 pages. Um, but that was very fast for me, and I was going to school, and I was just basically reading whenever, whenever I wasn't in class. So read this book, and it really changed my perspective on what heroes are and how to live a good life. It showed me these larger-than-life heroes who, unlike all the heroes I had grown up reading about and, and watching in movies and on TV, these were people that had seemingly normal jobs, um, creating concertos and uh, smelting copper and running factories and running a transcontinental uh, railroad. Yet, I could see from the book that these people's achievements and the way that they were living their lives uh, were incredibly heroic and also created many of the values that I sort of take for granted in my own life. Like at that point, I didn't really have any idea of these things being of great value to me. It wasn't something that I was thinking about. You know, I'm 17 years old. So this is when I really got interested in philosophy, per se. I finished Atlas Shrugged, and I was like, who is this guy, Ayn Rand? I'm going to, like, what else can I read by this guy? And then I quickly find out that it was actually a, a she, although, um, you know, she was once called the bravest man in America by Ludwig von Mises, and she really loved that compliment. So I think she wouldn't be offended by my assumption either. And, uh, and, and so that's where I went off on the deep end on philosophy, and I just started reading everything about and by Ayn Rand that I could get my hands on, and then from there actually branched out and started reading and even taking classes in other philosophers. So long-winded answer, but uh, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> That's funny. No, that's really funny. Yeah. I, whenever I first read her, I did not know that she was a woman either. I picked up, um, I don't remember which one it was. It was a very, very small book. And it was, it was about this one guy who went against the grain and it was really interesting. And, and I was hooked for a while. And then I, okay, interestingly enough, afterwards, because I was hooked, I picked up another book on, it, it was called the Ayn Rand cult. And I was like, why should I not believe this? And so, so that was fascinating. Um, in a little bit, I do want to throw at you a couple of, of thoughts on why people are against Rand. Um, I have two questions for you though. First one is just like a one-off. So I did not know that von Mises was a fan of Rand. Mm, yeah, they, they had uh, sort of an on-off relationship as did many liberty, uh, pro-liberty thinkers in the uh, 20th century. So Rand at one point befriended Henry Hazlitt, Leonard Reed, who went on to found Foundation for Economic Education. And actually, he was the first American publisher of Anthem, the book that you just mentioned. That's her short novella, a little over 100 pages. Yeah, he actually published that book. Uh, Hazlitt is the one who introduced Rand to Mises, Mises and, and Rand didn't see eye to eye on many things because uh, Mises took a, he took a practical economics perspective on what the government should and should not do and did not stand for individual rights on principle. And a great example of this was their disagreement over the military draft. Rand saw the military draft, which was actually in effect in her lifetime during Vietnam, and she, she saw that as a very clear violation of the principle of individual rights. You own your own life. You have a right to your own life, your own pursuit of happiness. Yet the military can draft you in and put you in this incredibly dangerous situation. And Mises said, well, this doesn't really break any of the economics principles that I, that I teach and that I know. And, and so I don't really have a problem with the draft. So this is, you know, they uh, eventually had some sort of following out over principle, uh, principled issues like this, where they just did not see to eye, eye to eye. But <clears throat> for those um, who are interested in this, this relationship, you can look up Mises's letter to Ayn Rand from 1958 and see him praising Rand, uh, saying that her Atlas Shrugged was uh, more than a novel, more than a story. It was uh, a moral condemnation of the politics of the time. You know, Rand and Mises had 
uh, both lived through FDR's years and saw uh, what collectivism did not only in Europe during World War II, but what it was doing here in America. Mm -hmm. Can you, so explain a little bit deeper collectivism and its historical roots. Collectivism is the idea that man exists, the, the purpose of his existence is service to the group. And the group has taken different forms throughout history. During the uh, Middle Ages, during the Crusades, the group would have been the Catholic Church. Uh, during World War II, uh, especially if you were in Nazi Germany, the collective was the fatherland, the state, the Reich. And the idea there was, well, your life is expendable. This idea largely goes back to, it goes all the way back to uh, to Immanuel Kant, but I think Wilhelm, uh, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, who was a follower of Kant's, really, he, he really drew out the implications of some of Kant's ideas and really spelled out this idea of collectivism. He and others have had this sort of organic theory of the state, that the state is like an organism and the individuals are merely its expendable cells and they exist to serve the ends of the state. And that is collectivism, that the individual, so individualism and collectivism are two diametrically opposed ideologies, one being the, uh, the theory upon which this country, America, was founded, the other being the basic blueprint for Nazi Germany, for Soviet Russia, for Maoist China, for today's North Korea. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so... What's the difference between collectivism and the common good? And I guess, what would Rand say about the co common good? Yeah, so the common good is, is a catchphrase that's often used to make collectivism sound appealing. So if collectivism is, is the product, the common good is its marketing campaign. This is how we get people to accept collectivism. So we get rid of things like individual rights. Uh, we get rid of your right to decide whether or not you're going to be in the military. You know, this is to, to go back to the example of the draft. Because if we uh, conscript people, well, that's for the common good. More people benefit from that. And typically throughout history, the common good is, you know, it's not always, uh, it, it, it's not necessarily the case that the common good those invoking that actually are talking about something that's going to benefit most people and benefit there and have to put in scare quotes because no one really benefits when other people's rights are violated. But the, the, the common good is, is, again, it's the slogan, it's the marketing campaign for collectivism, collectivism being the idea that the individual does not have a right to his own life. I'm sorry, did I answer your question? Yes, no, it, this is fascinating to me, very fascinating. Oh, and Rand's take on the common good was that the, the common good is invoked by those who, uh, who, who have the most power at that given time or who want the power to enact their own ideas. They claim the common good as the justification for what is going to benefit them. So there is no such thing as the common good. There are only a group of individuals and to sacrifice some individuals to other individuals is always immoral. Okay, I definitely want to come back to Rand's thoughts on different things, but morality. What, in your opinion, is morality, and how do we know that innate morality exists, or how do we know that there is maybe an objective morality? Yeah, I think objective and innate are very different things, and we can come back to that distinction. Um, so morality is a broader question than what is, what is a true morality, right? So morality encompasses any code that is intended to guide man's choices and actions. And so we could call Christian morality a thing, Kantian morality a thing, and objectivist morality a thing, right? These are different forms of morality. There's also the, the idea of morality of uh, moral subjectivism, going back to the ancient Greeks, to Thrasymachus, for instance, in Plato's The Republic, I believe, where the, the, uh, basically the idea is that the, the right, the just, the good, is the strong overpowering the weak. 
So morality is, you know, the broader subject is, okay, what is, what is the good? How does man live a good life? And then, uh, you know, the question, the further question is, is there any objective scientific answer to this? So Rand actually starts in a very interesting place. She doesn't say, okay, well, let's survey all the different moralities that have existed throughout history and kick the tires and see which one is best and which one she, she, we should accept. No, she asks, well, what is the purpose of this thing? And do we need it at all? If we don't need it, why are we going to waste our time talking about it? What gives rise to the need of morality? So in, if, you, if you look at life, if you look at the world, you see that there are two distinct classes of existence. There are things that are alive and there are things that are not alive, right? There's inanimate matter and then there is everything that is living. And nothing is going to make, no actions that happen in the world, no events that unfold, make any difference to a rock or a tree. They don't, or sorry, a rock. It, things do make difference to trees. Let me be clear on this. So, but, but nothing is of any value or consequence at all to a rock. A rock does not have some specific form that it aims to be, and some actions will cause it to be that, and others will not. But if you look at life, life faces this fundamental alternative of existence or non-existence, life or death. And in, in order to, to live and to remain alive and to continue to uh, attain values, living things need certain values to, to stay alive. And as soon as their life goes out of existence, they no longer can attain values. So values are things that are necessary for life. There's a, a naturalistic basis. The good is that which enables us to live and to flourish in our lives, and the bad is that which inhibits our lives, destroys them, makes it more difficult for us to flourish. So this is built into reality, built into the facts. There is this objective standard of morality. The good is that which promotes your life. The bad is that which retards it. And I mean, there's a lot more you could say, of course, about this subject, but I'm curious just getting that on the table, what your thoughts are. I think that's very fascinating. Um, so a lot of my thought processes have been influenced by a sort of classical framework. Um, the philosophers like Aristotle and Plato, um, and then also Christianity. And so I have been trying to come to understand what these things that I've understood only through the lens of Christianity are outside of Christianity so that I may either be able to take it to Christianity and strengthen my own understanding or, um, or step out of it. But like the interesting thing is, is, is truth exists and truth is and, and Christianity and all of these other religions and all of these other groups, they communicate a truth. It, it, that's that's what they as a group should be doing, communicating and guiding. And so it is interesting to me the way that you frame morality as a sort of a necessary thing. Mm. Yeah. Do you want to do you want me to dig into that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. OK, so what is morality? We, we sort of put dip, three different theories on the table here, right? We talked about the subjectivists like Thrasymachus, who thinks that morality is the will of the stronger. Basically, do whatever you want and make sure that you are the strongest so you, you can impose your will on other people. So that is subjectivism, the idea that values are subjective, dependent on the subject, not on reality. Then there's the intrinsic code of morality, which says that Values are things intrinsic to the nature of existence, aside from man, his needs, his wants, and his life. They are just things baked into the fabric of the universe that are not contextual in any way, shape, or form, not dependent on man in, in any way, shape, or form. And then there's the objective code, which says that values are facts of reality that are of some importance to man's life, given his life, given the requirements of his life, and given, given the specifics of his context, his interests, 
his uh, specific preferences, whether it be regarding food, music, or whatever. So Christianity is a form of intrinsicism. It is a form of saying, well, values like thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not adulter, are baked into the nature of reality. And regardless of one's consequences, or one's, one's context, rather, regardless of uh, any facts about man or his nature, these things are true. They are the given, they're handed down on the tablet from on high. So I, um, so I've just sort of set the table here. Like in philosophy, this is a means at least of looking at the different theories of ethics and how they compare. Um, do you want to talk a bit about, uh, you said that Christianity has its truth. Do you want to elaborate on what you mean there? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, and I just want to make sure that, I, that I've got this. So it's subjective, objective, and intrinsic. That's right. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so I don't know. Okay. Which, which, uh, which Christian group were you a part of and how deep did you go into it? So like, not very, um, so, some form of Protestantism, I guess you could say. And, um, I, you know, some details I left out of the story were that I had a, a friend, he was about a year older than me. He had a car when I didn't, he was kind of cool. And so he got me interested in going to Bible study and also like going to, <laughs> it's kind of funny, we went to a concert and it was only like after the concert that I found out that we had gone to a Christian rock concert. Like I couldn't even hear the lyrics or anything to, to make out that that was the case. Funny. <laughs> so, you know, my denomination was like the cool Christian kid who, who got me into Christianity, basically. And, you know, another element, another sort of pop culture element that got me interested in this, and this I think is just indicating like, you know, the depth. But I don't know if you heard of the Left Behind series. I forget who the author was that wrote them, but... He wrote a dramatization of, what was it, the book of Revelations, last book, book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And my, uh, yeah, my mom was listening to that on tape in the car. And so I got really interested in, in that and, uh, and in Christianity from these, you know, sort of chance events in my life got, got me interested. So um, I hope that gives you enough context. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so you asked about truth, correct? Yeah, you were saying a minute ago that Christianity has a certain truth or that you think it does and that you want to find out how it relates and might integrate with some of the stuff that I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically, and and I'm, I'm, I've always said this, I'm entirely open to being wrong and to changing my opinion, um, but but I think that I first have to understand where I guess I would be wrong. So, okay. So the way that Christianity goes about things, it's basically explaining that there's a natural law and that's, that's the fundamental is natural law. And I would love to kind of expound that upon that natural law. Then you get morality and you get these intrinsic rights and you get a sort of individuality. But I think that that is an interesting thing is, is the, the lack of emphasis on individuality versus on others. And I have that this is a topic that I've been playing around with in my head a lot recently, just like, how do you, how do you go about separating what needs to be individualistic versus a sort of helping others because it's gracious. And I think that if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, I believe that, you said something along the lines of there's a difference between, um, oh, givers versus takers. And ah, in my podcast, I had a conversation with Adam Grant, who wrote the book Give and Take, and he characterizes givers and takers and um, also uh, matchers in his book. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. I thought that was an absolutely fascinating uh, topic because of the fact that I think that Christianity means to to promote this this giving but not so much in the sense that you give everything that you have and you have nothing left and more in the sense of his um the givers that actually succeed 
I think that that's what it means. And I may be wrong. I may be entirely interpreting it wrong, but I do think that it is, it is, um, it is problematic. Thoughts on natural law? Mm-hmm. Yeah, let me just say a couple things before we go there. So for one, I commend the intellectual independence, and I think that that absolutely has to be the, the number one when you're talking about any ideas. It's, does this make sense to me? And you absolutely should not accept any idea that doesn't make sense to you. So uh, right on, and, and definitely hold to that, and uh, hold every idea to the fire and keep only the ones that do make sense. So, uh, and then before, also before natural law, so Christian truths. So, you know, one of the things that actually has occurred to me is that ethical principles are induced from observing facts about the nature of reality and about man and his relationships with other people. So over the millennia, people have lived in all sorts of communities, all sorts of societies, and they've seen, for instance, that when you lie to other people to gain values, you cause all sorts of social discord. And this leads to revenge, to people killing one another, and to societies breaking down. And so there's evidence here to generalize and say, well, just universally, when you lie to other people to gain values from them, when you fraud, defraud them or, or otherwise, that doesn't work out so well. That is bad. And we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't allow people to do that. There's something wrong about doing this. It hurts society. It hurts our lives. It hurts the lives of the people directly involved. Mm-hmm. And so they... You're, you're able to look at the evidence of, of experience and formulate a principle the same way that you can formulate principles about natural events, like the law of gravity. You can observe a chandelier moving just so, an apple falling just so. You can set up experiments with balls that fall at certain angles and, and measure gravity that way and come to this in inductive conclusion about this certain physical principle. And I think you can do the same. And I think people did do the same with ethical principles. They observed that given man, given his nature, given the way that the world works, these are things that you shouldn't do. And I think that religion was sort of a codification of much of this knowledge. But it was put in such a way as to require a certain epistemology, as you put it in philosophy, epistemology being the study of the nature of knowledge. How do we know what is true? How do we gain knowledge of anything? Well, in Christian epistemology, you have faith, and things are true by the fact that you believe that they are true. And this has some pretty big consequences. If you accept an epistemology of faith, then, for instance, your faith might tell you that you ought to uh, kill non-believers, you ought to kill infidels, and that you'll be rewarded in an afterlife with 99 virgins. If you have faith in it, if faith is a means of knowledge, then you can use that to justify any sort of action. So the basic problem is that it's far more destructive to accept a single truth on the basis of faith than it is to accept 10 falsehoods on the basis of reason. Because if you hold to reason, if you hold fast to your reasoning mind, then you at least keep the source of knowledge of differentiating between the two. And so this is a problem that I see, at least with Christianity, is that it asks, asks you, in certain respects, to renounce your reason. And I think there are all sorts of arguments that could be had back and forth on this topic and, and have been had for centuries. But from where I'm standing, Christianity does ask you to believe things on faith. And by renouncing your mind, it actually leads you against the sort of intellectual independence that you expressed just a minute ago. You gave the example of a... Um of a moral truth being tested in the same way that gravity could be tested just in, in our own experiences and throughout history. What is an example of that? 
Well, I wasn't saying tested. I was actually saying induced. Like this is how we can derive the principle. Uh, I think that if you were to apply the sort of scientific testing to human relationships and human behavior, you'd probably find most of it is going to give you uh, evidence of the principle. And then there might be some cases where a, a guy, for instance, steals a million dollars and makes his way to a remote island. And then you'd say, well, look, this experimental evidence seems to disprove this broad ethical principle. Where is the evidence for the principle? This seems to, to, to be a counter argument against it. And I think even in this case, if you were to investigate psychologically the life of this person who gets away with the million dollars, well, in order to live his life, he's going to make new friends, make new acquaintances. They're going to want to know, how did you make this money? You know, how did you become so wealthy? And people will just they'll be, you know, ask questions about his life and, and how he got where he was. And he's going to have to spin this web of lies that in time will just engulf his entire life. And you see this sort of thing happen, actually. Elizabeth Holmes, the CEO founder of Theranos, was just... Uh, was, was just convicted and will spend something like 80 years behind bars because she built a whole life on a foundation of lies and simply could no longer tell the difference between truth and falsehood. So when do you think that lying is okay and what makes it okay in that moment? Like what, what separates it? Yeah, so the way I was putting it earlier is when I said when you lie to gain values from other people, and I think that's that last part, that qualification is really important because if you're lying to the Nazi at the door about the fact that you're harboring Jews in your basement, well, you're not trying to gain a value. You are trying to keep, you know, this evil person from destroying values. And, you know, the good owes nothing to the evil. So you don't owe honesty to this evil person who's looking to, to murder others. And this goes in every case. So, you know, it, whether it's a Nazi at the door or something less extreme, the basic principle is that the good doesn't owe anything to the evil. And so it, it's, as long as you're not attempting to gain values through lying, then I think you are OK. But there are very, very few instances in which that is the case. I love that statement that you just said, the good owes nothing to the evil. Um, why do you think it is that that sometimes good feels like it should give to evil. Ah, why does the good feel as though it should give to evil? Could you give me some idea of what you mean by the good in this instance? Sure. Um, Hitler was able to, to do as, as, much as, he, as much as he did because of the fact that you can much more easily convince good people to do things if you tell them it's for something good. Like if you say mm -hmm. that, if you do this, then this, and you can appeal to their goodness much more easily and convince them to do things. Like even, even I have probably been convinced of, of, of certain things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Th there are several strands there that are incredibly interesting. So it's absolutely the case that people convince other people to do things that are not in their own long-term self-interest by appealing to the good. And as we talked about earlier, it's often the common good. You ought to do this thing. You ought to give up this right, whatever it is, for the common good. So it's just a, it's just a fact that people aren't going to go for things that are not good. I mean, you're going to lose any argument right out of the gate by conceding the moral high ground to your opponent by saying, actually, this thing is bad, but I still want to do it, right? So those who hold the moral high ground win the argument. And if you go back to Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, he begins his whole book on ethics by saying, well, every human action seems to aim at some good. Every action seems to aim at some good. What is that good? Well, it, and it seems to, for a reason here too, because people think that the good is something often that it isn't. The good is, you know, in this case, sacrificing a person's rights to determine whether or not to join the military in order to ensure that we can have enough people to fight in this war overseas. So, the, but why is it that the good is, why is it that the evil has been so successful throughout history 
in using the good as a means of using the claim of the good as a means of doing evil. And I think ultimately the answer is the ethics of altruism. If you go back to the fundamental core of the problem here, it's the idea that what you should do, the moral purpose of your life is to serve other people. If you believe that the moral purpose of your life is to serve other people, then you can be convinced that the, that in order to serve the common good, you have to sacrifice your values, including values that are real legitimate values like rights and Jewish friends, perhaps, if we're talking about Nazi Germany. So I think that if you accept this idea, this basic idea that the fundamental good is the good of other people, then you can be convinced of many, many absurdities and convinced to do many atrocities, to paraphrase Voltaire. Interesting. Because, so I don't actually think that every single person that is convinced to do something that they think is good or that they think is in line with the common good actually puts others above themselves. It's almost like a, an altruism. Like if you can get somebody into an altruistic state, then in that moment, it would it would seem that you could convince them. So I guess my question is, yes, it makes sense that if somebody is convinced that the common good is the, the primary good, then they will do certain things, but you can't convince a full society. So then... Uh, well, we have some counterexamples on the table, like Nazi Germany, for instance, the land of philosophers and poets before World War II, incredibly... In- Uh, intelligent society, and they were convinced by national socialism via uh, full-on democracy. I mean, they voted in their national socialism. So if we want to talk about a contemporary example of this, people are talking about democratic socialism, that it's okay to vote away people's rights as long as we do it as a majority, is what this boils down to. Um, so majorities have been convinced to, to commit atrocities throughout history. And this is why the American founders actually did not want to establish a democracy. We have democratic institutions like voting, but what we have is a constitutional republic. It's limited. It limits the power of the majority to violate the rights of any minority. And of, of course, it didn't start out this way. We had the hideous... Uh, tr- uh, hideous practice of slavery in this country. Uh, but the founding principle was that the individual has certain inalienable rights and that no majority can vote those rights away as had been done in history, uh, which the, the founders were very familiar with and has been done since. Interesting. Okay. So what do you think is the biggest issue regarding our society today? Well, that's a a big question, but I would go to the deepest philosophic problem, which is, again, in my opinion, this goes to epistemology, to theory of knowledge. Right now, we have an epistemological crisis in philosophy. And this isn't the first time that this has happened in history, but this is a particularly uh, dangerous time because of the immense power we have to destroy ourselves at this point. So epistemology, theory of knowledge, what's the problem, right? Well, the problem is that after Immanuel Kant, basically, uh, he he inaugurated, he, he baked subjectivism into all of philosophy that's come after him. He baked subjectivism into the human mind by saying that we don't actually perceive reality. What we perceive is this sort of filtered image caused by these things called categories in our heads. And Kant believed that we all have the same categories, and so we all basically divide up the world and see it the same. But it didn't take long for Hegel to splinter this idea into, well, different states, different societies have different truths, And then for Marx to come along and say, well, not only do different states and societies have different truths, different classes of people have different truths. 
So rich people have a different logic and a whole different means of seeing the world than poor people do. This is Marx's polylogism, many logics, many different uh, views of the truth and different means of getting at the truth. And that has been broken up further, splinted a thousandfold further by postmodernism and the critical race theory that has come after it. So now not only do different classes have their own truths, supposedly, but people of different races, different uh, sexes, different sexual orientations, even different waistlines have different truths. And so the problem is, if we have all of these different truths and different means of claiming knowledge about the world, then uh, we're all completely cut off from one another. And we can't establish any sort of universal principles. We can't establish any actual facts. Truth goes out the window. And instead, what we have is a bunch of competing narratives all designed to gain the greatest amount of power for our group. And if this is the case, then how do you possibly have a society? You can't. The only thing that you can have is increasing global balkanization and tribalism. People splitting off into their own separate tribes, and those tribes eventually will get smaller and smaller as well, as people just find more and more ways to divide up the whole sphere of truth and with it the whole sphere of values. So I would say that this is the deepest formulation that I could find of the problem facing the world today. It's an epistemological problem. And what we need to regain is what America's founders learned during the Enlightenment and what the Enlightenment uncovered, which is the fact that there is one reality out there, that we have specific means of gaining truth of that reality as a species. Truth is correspondence to reality. It's not dependent on our skin color or how much money we make. And we are capable of establishing these universal principles by looking out at the facts of reality. And once we do that, once we get back on a firm epistemological footing, then we can correct our problems in uh, morality and in politics and so on and so forth. But I think that as a culture, if we don't, if we don't uh, stop being skeptical about the fact that we can have and, and find universal truths, then uh, it's, it's a pretty difficult conversation and different difficult way forward. Ah, interesting. So is it your belief that we get back to this foundation or footing of understanding that there is some sort of objectivity through education or where do you think that starts? Well, education, I don't take to be synonymous with schooling. I think that uh, education is certainly a part of it and uh, uh, it would be great to have the school's begin to teach a, a rational basis to knowledge again, or at least to instill the fact that there is one reality that we can all see and, and learn about. Um, but I think, yeah, schools need to be a, a big part of it. I think that journalism needs to be a big part of it. I think that the arts, basically, I think that there's work to be done in every field of human endeavor for people to point out all of the connections between their, the, the specific field they happen to be in and the facts of reality, the facts that, that we all can perceive and, and come to know. Interesting. Okay. So you said journalism and the arts, and it seems like you are going along the lines of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but more so the humanities. The humanities are key because the humanities are what produce the intellectuals who then go out into the world and write articles and write books and teach courses and teach people how to think. That is their job. Unfortunately, the humanities have renounced that job for decades. It started in philosophy. It started with postmodernism and uh, critical studies and literature and uh, eventually economics and every other field. So this is... Uh, this is a problem that comes from the humanities. Uh, philosophy is a humanities subject. And, um, and so in order to correct it at root, yes, we have to correct many things in the humanities. But the architect, the uh, landscaper, the guy who makes wine or guitars, all of these people are, are part of our society. And every, uh, every person that 
comes to understand these ideas and comes to apply them in their own lives, whether it's in a board meeting or just in conversation with family at home, has some impact on pushing the culture in the right direction. I like that a lot. So you said that humanities produce intellectuals. What about the humanities is so important to human growth and development? Well, the humanities, it's in the name, right? The study of human beings, their behavior, their relationships, how they do and and ought to live. So if we want a, a philosophy that enables humans to live and flourish on Earth, then we need people who are uh, knowledgeable of what humans are and how they ought to live. And so these people tend to be in the humanities and tend to also be the people that go into professions that then teach these ideas and proliferate uh, them to the, to the widest possible audience. I like that a lot. I, I love that, that view of the humanities. I've always, I've always um, recognized that the humanities are very important. And recently I started asking people like what makes them come alive. And the interesting thing is, is that it's always something in like immensely human, like something that is not able to be done without some sort of rational or creative or something, some type of very, very human faculty, which is very interesting. Yeah, humans have the potential to be the greatest possible values in our lives and also the greatest possible disvalues because other humans can help us to an immense degree, a degree we can hardly imagine. I mean, just think about the world 200 years ago and the world today and the incredible impact that humans have had on making our lives better. But also humans can rob us, they can kill us, they can spread false ideologies that end up killing the culture and and eventually abolishing all of our individual rights. So uh, it's it's not surprising to me that humans are of interest to other humans. Uh, I think it, it's it's actually completely natural. That makes a lot of sense. So you you host the Philosophy for Flourishing podcast, and I I found it to be very very helpful in just bringing a lot of interesting ideas into my day. What what is flourishing? And and so so one interesting interesting thought is that. Um, some people think that flourishing is not possible. Like some people think that the end of life is to suffer less. Why is flourishing actually possible? Yeah, great questions. So I take the the meaning of that word to stem back, go back to uh, Aristotle and his use of the word eudaimonia, eudaimonia in the Greek. Flourishing refers to, right in its name, to a flower, and when a, when a plant flowers, it's at its highest potential. It's reached its peak, right? And the same idea can apply to other living things. Humans can reach their peak. They can live to their greatest potential. Why do I think that's possible? And why do I think others don't? Well, if you ask Jordan Peterson, obviously, um, he would say that, well, yeah, life is suffering, and the idea is to minimize that suffering as much as possible. That should be our goal. And if you look at his context, it's not really that surprising that this is the, con- the conclusion that he's come to. I mean, he's, he's a working psychologist. Uh, he's been through stuff himself and with his family, and he's working with all sorts of people that are barely able to to keep their lives straight. And so The evidence that he's looking at, and I think it's not all of the evidence that's relevant here, uh, would seem to to point to that conclusion. But if you look at the world more broadly, and if you look at the the people who are having great lives, who might not be on MTV, if that's still a thing, really dating myself, might not be on whatever the equivalent of that is today. They might not be a YouTube star. But we all know these people, perhaps our parents, perhaps our friends' parents. We know people who are living really excellent lives, not only because others think that they are and they have like a a really fantastic bank account, but because we can actually just look and see that these people are are happy and they're living to the hilt. They're, They're really getting up in the morning and they're going and pursuing values that they love and, and know, um, how, how to, to achieve and how they want to achieve them. So I think just all of us have the ability to look out in the world and see evidence of flourishing. 
Beyond that, there are all sorts of uh, depictions in fiction. And I think fiction is actually a great source of truths. Aristotle said something like, uh, you know, fiction is far more important than history. I forget the exact quote here, but he, he was making the point that uh, fiction in general and, and the arts in general, rather, uh, enable us to see how things ought to be, not just how things are. And so we can look at fiction. We can see flourishing heroes living incredible lives. My favorite is Howard Rourke from Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead. You, if you, if you want a, a book that can help you just achieve incredible things in life and understand what it means to be successful in life, I know of no better book than that one. And it, it gives us a demonstration of what flourishing is. It's not happiness in this or that moment. It's not you're continuously smiley from beginning to end. It's life is, it can be a battle to achieve your values. But if you're willing to pay the price, you can have what you want in life and you can have an incredible life. But you do believe that there is a price. Well, Rand at one point summarized her philosophy sort of facetiously. She said, God said, take what you want and pay for it. And this, I think, applies to morality in, in general. Take what you want and pay for it. What does that mean? It means that reality has a specific nature. In order for it to, to in order for you to bring about the things that you want in life, you can't just wish. Wishing won't make it so. Nature to be commanded must be obeyed. So there's a law of causality that determines what can happen and how it will happen. And if you want, for instance, um, a, uh, an acquaintance of mine, a guy I interviewed, Blake Scholl, is developing a company that will uh, make supersonic flight commercially viable again. We'll have supersonic flight, which hasn't been on the market for several decades now, thanks to the Concorde jet being retired. Um, he is making this a reality. And he can't just sit around and wish that it's going to happen. He's got to go out and live his life at his fullest. He says, living at your personal red line. He's paying a price, in a sense, by figuring out what actions in reality will cause the effects that he's looking to cause. So that's what I, what I mean by there's a price to it. You have to pay for it. It's, well, you have to look out at reality. And you have to, in order to command that really, you have to obey it, meaning you have to know how things work, why they work the way they do. In his case, he actually has to understand physics and how to make a plane go at a certain speed and burn certain fuel and whatnot. And, but in general, how do you, how do you live a good life? Uh, well, it's learning causality. It's becoming a disciple of causality, really understanding how the world works in order to get those values that you want in life. I like that idea of how the world works. So you, you mentioned that um, the idea of fiction and and Rand was obviously a huge fan of fiction. Um, she she did a really good job of encapsulating what she believed ought to exist through her fiction, which I think is amazing. But I guess in in understanding this concept of what ought to exist, in order to expand your possibility and your conception of what is possible, you, you do have to understand how the world works. And you kind of touched on this with the law of causality. And then also we touched on it a little bit earlier with some sense of morality. What do you think are these pillars of how the world works that kind of ground every single conception of what is potentially possible in the future? Hmm. I want to make sure I understand the question. So what are the basic laws that we have to understand in order to be able to grasp cause and effect? Yes. Like, what are the basic laws that we need to understand based on our understanding of history, philosophy, etc., so that our conceptions of what ought to be are actually within reason? Mm -hmm. Well, to go really broad here. The most basic one is the primacy of existence. So in philosophy, there are different theories about existence and consciousness. And we just hit upon this a second ago when I said reality, if you want to change something, you can't just wish that it's going to happen. If you could, if consciousness had primacy over existence, then you could just will things into existence. And so if we want to understand 
cause and effect, and we want to have the ability to understand our world and to act on it, the most basic principle that we need is to understand the primacy of existence. And this was a huge tenet of Aristotle. And really, the ideas, the basic fundamental building blocks of objectivism, Ayn Rand's philosophy, go back to Aristotle. And Aristotle's focus on the facts of reality. The facts of reality are what determine truths. We need to understand those facts, including in the case you asked about morality and, and about humans. In, in our case, we need to understand the, uh, the, the facts that give rise to the need of morality, to understand what morality is, how to be moral, and why to do that. I think I lost the second thread of your question. You mind to remind me? Okay, so, so the, I basically was asking, in order to, to conceive of a, an interesting future, we have to ground ourselves in some sort of some sort of reality, some sort of conception of these are, are the bounds that actually do exist. Like these are the rules that we do need to follow so that we can actually step away from the rules that we don't need to follow. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you answered quite a bit on the primacy of existence as well as Aristotle. I guess underneath that, is there anything that you think is necessary as, as rules that the law of causality, morality... Well, I think there are certain basic truths, but when you ask what are the truths that are necessary to develop the future, you have to, you know, at, at one point, at, at one level of abstraction, you could go way broad as I just did and say, well, you need to understand, for instance, the primacy of existence. When you get more granular, the, the things that you need to know to do the things that you want to do, well, those are contextual. We don't all need to know what Blake Scholl needs to know in order to run a successful supersonic flight company. I don't need to know the laws of physics to be an editor at a journal and to write articles about philosophy and record podcasts. Um, but I do need to know other things that are, are relevant and specific to my field. So, you know, one principle that is helpful for podcasting is like, have a good signal chain so that your microphone isn't just like your computer microphone. So you can go really granular or you can go really broad. And the broader you go, the greater applicab uh, applicability you'll have to future scenarios. Um, the, the basic truth, I'll just echo, is this idea of the, the primacy of existence. So there have been all sorts of different theories of knowledge throughout history, and these have consequences for how people live their lives and what they do at the political level. And... So we want to get epistemology right. And the basic thing that we always have to keep in mind is that our minds do not create or alter reality directly. They are used to uh, understand reality. They're tools of cognition, not of creation. Tool, tools of cognition, not creation. And so I think that that basically is the, the primary truth that we ought to keep in mind. If we keep that in mind, downstream from that, we're going to hit upon many other broad abstract truths that are necessary to a flourishing future and to innovation and technology and progress. One of them being the principle of individual rights. People uh, need certain values in order to live, in order to, to uh, maintain their lives and thrive. And they have to create those values by their own effort. And if they put in the effort, but they are kept from using those values, their rights are violated, then you do this to any significant degree and they lose the ability to actually live their lives. They might even lose their lives altogether. So we need to recognize that by human nature, by the nature of scarcity, by the nature of the, in, the actual individual metaphysical nature of the human being, I am you, uh, I am me, you are you, we're, we are different, uh, we're, we are metaphysically separate. We are both individuals. We need to understand that truth and to protect, to recognize and protect people's individual rights so that they have the property, the resources to enact bold visions, like, for instance, trying to colonize Mars. Can't do that without a, an amazing amount of property. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, okay, so, so you touched a little bit on this topic of, first off, the you are you, I am me. Um, and, and second, on the topic of 
of just this broader scope of subjectivism, and you said that it boiled down to Kant. Why are we experiencing a lot of subjectivism, and and where did Kant go wrong? Oh, well, uh, he went wrong on every single fundamental of philosophy. Um, because Kant said very early on in his critique of pure reason, I have found it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith. Why, why would that be? Well, we were just a minute ago talking about the primacy of existence versus the primacy of consciousness. And if your goal is to deny that uh, existence has primacy, if your goal is to say, well, in fact, there is a consciousness that has primacy, it's a consciousness that rules over everything that exists, then you at some point have to deny the primacy of existence. So if you want to, to hold that there is a God and that law comes from God, then at some point you have to say, well, science, yeah, that's great, but that only goes so far. Um, and this is exactly what Kant did. So he denied knowledge in order to make room for faith and did so by, as the philosopher David Stove put it, positing the greatest, though also the simplest bluff ever tried. He said that the world is cut into two different realms. There's this realm that we experience, and it's the, the realm in which we live our everyday, day-to-day -day lives. And then there's the realm of reality as it really is. And that other reality, that true reality, is the reality where moral law exists, where perfection exists. But we can never know that reality directly. We're completely and unalterably cut off from it. The implication being here that Kant somehow discovered the magic doorway to this other reality, but that nobody else ever could or would. So Kant divides the world into two different realms. And he says that the problem with scientists throughout history is that they've tried to figure out how the mind grasps reality. But just as Copernicus had spearheaded his revolution by saying that the earth, uh, revolves around the sun, not vice versa. Kant said, well, I'm going to have my own Copernican revolution. It's not that the mind grasps reality. It's that it creates reality. It actually creates reality via these filters in our minds. So here you see a flame. When you put your hand to the flame, you feel a burn. But there's no such thing as causation. It's not that the fire causes the burning. We can't look out at reality and see anything like causation, as abstract as it is. No, causality is just a filter that we impose on the evidence of experience. And it's, it's not a, anything to do with reality as it is. It's just this means of us filtering our experience. And so this is Kant's means of uh, instituting subjectivism and the primacy of consciousness on a broad scale. And Kant had incredible uh, impact on the ideas of the 19th century, and those ideas have continued to have an incredible impact through to today. So uh, Karl Marx, for instance, of any philosopher, his uh, Communist Manifesto is the work that is taught most. If you go to opensyllabus.com, I believe it's called, you can look up the most assigned works in, on college campuses. And the first work of philosophy that you'll find on the list, it's like number four on the list below a few different writing manuals, is Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto. And I alluded earlier as to the connection between Kant and Marx, so I won't rehash that. But essentially, Kant has had an incredibly long intellectual shadow in the world. And even those who don't even, there, there are many people who don't even know it, who are in some way influenced by his work and working under his intellectual umbrella. Interesting. So how did, how did Kant come to this thought about these two realities? Because it would, it would seem to me that if, if there are two, two different realities and he's aware of the fact that you can't know of the second reality, like how would he even come to understand it in the first place? Yeah, the same way that um, perhaps Lewis Carroll came up with, with his ideas for his books. Uh, I, I presume just via imagination.
But this goes to a deeper point. And again, this is an epistemological point. We talked earlier about wishing won't make it so, that our minds are means of uh, cognizing reality, of, of cognition, but not of creation. But those who abandon reality inevitably pick up other means of supposed knowledge. And these are always some form of whims, wishes, feelings. So how did Kant come up with his other world? Why did he find it necessary to deny knowledge in order to make room for faith? Because his feelings told him that that's what he ought to do. And why? Well, he was he grew up in a, a very puritanical Christian household and was, um, you know, sort of the the model of the ascetic saint, if you will. So, you know, there, there are deeper moral reasons there, but the epistemological reason is that he took his feelings, his emotions, his whims and wishes as a means of knowledge. And when you do that, when you give consciousness primacy and not existence, you inevitably lead to life-destroying ideas and actions. Interesting. Okay, so objectivism does not try to get rid of spirituality, but it does look at it differently, correct? Um, I don't know that objectivism tries to get rid of anything except perhaps more broadly irrationality. And so there's a sense in which uh, objectivists might like go out and, and boycott churches or, or I should say picket and protest churches or something. But Okay, so objectivism is a philosophy about living your life to its fullest. And the point of your life is your own happiness. That is the, the purpose of your life. If your happiness comes from deriding other people's religious beliefs, well, you know, there, there might be a problem there. Perhaps there's a, actually a legitimate means of, of having happiness that way, but I don't know of too many people who are, who are doing that. So... Uh, the, the objectivist position is that reason is man's only means of knowledge. And, you know, at that fundamental level, it is therefore adamantly opposed to religion. We talked about earlier about retaining that independence of mind and only accepting ideas that you understand. And I would submit that that's really hard to do if you adopt any religion. So if you, uh, you know, you, you might come up with some sorts of logical hoops that you can jump through, pretzels you can tie yourself in, in order to, uh, to, to keep those two things. But I think at, at a fundamental level, there's this really important difference in, and, um, and antagonism between the two systems of thought. And that's what it is. It's reason versus faith. So everything that we've talked about, really, it's very interesting. Everything has sort of come back to this point of, uh, what is our means of knowledge and can wishing make something so? That's very, very fascinating. I'm definitely going to have to think more on this topic of reason versus faith. I do want to dive into a little bit of um, just flourishing again. I think that the whole topic of flourishing is very interesting because it's so applicable to every single person's life. Just like how do you go about living um, – and also, I think one of the topics that was most intriguing to me just getting into philosophy was the concept of ought. Like, why is there an ought? It, and, and I think that that's, it's very fascinating to, to dig into. So, so yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, those are both really intriguing um, topics and, and deep topics. Flourishing, of course, can apply to everybody. And, and, and you know, there's a sense in which you might say it ought to apply to everybody. Wouldn't it be great if, if everyone was living flourishing lives? I think everyone's lives would be so much better just by the, the, uh, the fact that other people's lives were so much better and that they were actually flourishing. Um, so the, the concept of ought, though, I think is diametrically opposed to the concept of flourishing. And, and oughts and duties in general are diametrically opposed to flourishing because if you think about what a duty is, is it's an unchosen obligation. It's an obligation that you did not choose. Now, you can have obligations that you did choose. You can choose to have kids and thereby uh, develop an obligation to feed, clothe, and nurture those kids. 
Uh, you can choose to run a business and thereby be obligated to uh, honor your contracts with other people. And basically, there are all sorts of oughts in the world in a sense, but they're all tied to ifs. If I want to do this, then I need to do that. If I want to live a flourishing life, then I need to enact the causes that enable people to flourish. If I want to run a successful business, then I need to enact the causes that enable people to run successful businesses. So there are all sorts of imperatives in the world, but they're not, as Kant would put it, categorical imperatives, imperatives that apply for all people, regardless of choice. They are hypothetical imperatives. If I want to live a good life, then I have to do X. And so shoulds and oughts and duties, to the extent that those words are used to refer to things that don't stem from, derive from the facts, derive from man's legitimate concerns with his own life and with, with flourishing, they uh, do immense amounts to uh, inhibit flourishing and keep people from living great lives. The oughts and the duties, by the way, are the same sorts of justifications used when people invoke the common good. We have a duty to serve the common good. That's why you ought to sacrifice your right to determine whether or not to join the military, sacrifice your right to own this piece of property, you name it. Is there like, okay, so, so it makes sense that there is a potentially um, evolutionary reason why the common good was, was so necessary, like, like tribally speaking. Do you think that it's possible that it's because we have gotten away from this need for tribalism that the common good doesn't serve us as much anymore? Well, I don't think it ever served us. And uh, I don't think tribalism, it, to the extent that you mean that in the philosophic sense of a tribe that essentially does exactly what collectivism does, but on a smaller scale, collectivism and tribalism are really, in a sense, synonyms. The, the idea of tribalism is that the individual does not himself have any moral worth or value, any importance. His importance is as a means of serving the tribe. So in that sense, I don't think that tribalism or any ideas such as the common good used to sell tribalism or collectivism have ever served anyone in any way. Um, the, the idea of the common good uh, to, to the extent that it has any rational meaning would have to mean the good of all men of a certain group. But it's never the way it's used. If you look at when people invoke the common good, what is it they're trying to do? Well, they're trying to sacrifice, sacrifice the, the values and the rights of some people to the desires of others. And so if we ever do get uh, democratic socialism, for instance, in this country, this is how it will come about and this is how it will operate. It will operate by majority vote, by full majoritarian democracy to violate the rights of certain people by claiming that in doing so, they're serving the common good, the good of whatever ruling clique hap happens to be in power at that point. Interesting. So whenever I said tribalism, I kind of mean um, like whenever survival was, was the end. A and th I guess that, that, would, that would put us back pretty far because that would make us much less um, conscious, maybe, just like the only end was survival. An interesting thought that I would like to throw at you, I was reading a book recently and they were talking about how, um, how consciousness is, is potentially an earlier, like it's more recent. Have you heard of that? And also what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so... Um... Just to, to circle back to tribalism for just a second. Um, so d did tribes exist and have to cooperate in certain ways to, to live? Of course. Um, would any tribe benefit from sacrificing one of its members to the group? Well, to put some, <laughs> some flesh on those bones. Uh, well, in one case in which this might occur would be like cannibalism. Like the only way for the group to, to survive is for this person to be eaten. Um, you know, to, to what extent has, has 
this really been a, a key factor in uh, helping humanity come about? I think really to, to get into that discussion, we have to get some concretes on the table and discuss their, their merits and whatnot. So uh, the, the second part of that, will you remind me? Yes, I was asking about, um, do you think consciousness is a more recent phenomena or is it, has it, is it, is it innate to humanity? Well, I think those are two uh, mutually compatible ideas. It can be both. It can be a more recent phenomenon and it can be exclusive to humanity. I don't think it's exclusive to humanity. I think that humans have a certain type of consciousness that animals don't, right? They have a conceptual consciousness. They can figure out, as in it's the, the problems called in philosophy, the one and the many. What is the universal? What is the thing that makes all chairs the same type of thing? Is it something about the material of the chairs themselves or are all chairs a reflection of some form in another realm, as Plato thought? Or is it something about the chairs specifically, these entities here on Earth, as Aristotle thought? So I think that consciousness is probably what scientists call an emergent property. First, we had some of the basic... Uh, hardware necessary for consciousness to develop. First, the hardware came about. And then over time, as the hardware made it more and more possible, the software came online, so to speak. We got consciousness, the, the, the lights lit up. I don't know if this holds uh, evolutionary uh, truth here. I think that we'd have to kick this one over to a professional scientist to tell us whether or not the, uh, the facts are on the side of his theory, but it seems to be the most plausible theory that I've heard is that consciousness is, is an emergent property. Um, but that being said, we, we know, uh, or at least I think we do, that we evolved from uh, apes and other animals, that evolution in general is a, a mechanism by which species came about and diversified. And consciousness does not seem to be even just on the face of it like i can call my dog's name and he comes to me there's something going on there that's mental that's not just physical it's not atoms bumping into atoms and then he's coming when called no there's there's mental phenomena there so animals certainly have consciousness is it the same type of consciousness no even the best primatologists that i know of say that human consciousness is different and they can cite all sorts of incredible examples of animal intelligence in octopus, in gorillas, in lions, in dolphins, in elephants. There's all sorts of incredibly intelligent animal life out there that clearly has consciousness. But what they don't have is the ability to form abstractions, to latch on to whole categories of phenomena. So when I say book, for instance, I could be talking about the book in front of me or I could be talking about all books that have ever existed. And animals simply, as far as we can tell, don't have the ability to form generalizations, to form abstractions, such as to be able to think in broader, more abstract terms about universal principles instead of just the concretes that happen to be there in front of them at the moment. Ah, interesting. I like that a lot. You mentioned concepts. So what are concepts? Concepts are our means of divvying up the existence that we see in the world by their characteristics. They are uh, created by the human mind, but not subjective in that they are based on, when you have a legitimate concept at least, is based on the facts out there in the world. So if we have the concept of a, uh, well, actually, let's just talk about how concepts are formed. So you see, uh, for instance, multiple things that walk around and make noises and you see that they're clearly separate entities um, and in time your uh, vision is less hazy and you see that some of them walk around on two feet and they seem to converse with have four legs have four legs and they walk around and bark at mailmen um, so you see that there are essential similarities between the two humans the facts that they walk on two legs, they seem to be intelligent, they, uh, they talk, and you see the, how those similarities, even though they're different in a million innumerable ways, they're more similar than this other thing over here that is quite different because it walks around on four legs and barks. 
So you develop concepts by looking out at the world and seeing similarities and differences and classifying the facts of reality in, in accordance with, uh, with what you perceive. Ah, uh, okay. So it's very important that people get concepts correct. Like we, we have clarity whenever it comes to our concepts, right? Um, how, how can we test the clarity of our concepts or how do we, how do we crystallize, I guess, the clarity of our concepts? Yes, this is an excellent question. And by the way, um, I'm going to have to wrap up soon, but uh, we can certainly have more conversations down the road and, and dive even deeper into philosophy. This stuff is just endlessly fascinating to me and I hope to others. So how do we know that our concepts are correct? Well, if we ask Aristotle, if we just look out at reality in general, we can see that concepts come from reality. They're, they're derived from reality, if they're legitimate at all. They're based in the evidence, the, the facts of reality. And so if we want to know if our concepts are correct, we should go back to that evidence. We should say, what facts of reality give rise to this concept? Why do we need this concept? What ideas out there in the world does it actually bring to our attention, bring to our focus? Why is it that we need to hone in on this supposed class of things? Does it actually have reference out there in existence? If, if there are no reference, if we have an anti-concept, so to speak, a concept that actually isn't meant to classify anything that exists, but rather to obliterate uh, more legitimate concepts, then we won't be able to find facts of reality that support it. So, um, you know, that is in principle and in, in pattern how you figure out whether or not you have clear concepts. It's what actual concretes out there in the world can I point to that are evidence for and give rise to this concept? Interesting. And would you consider that a, like a, a, um, an, a more objectivist approach or is that, is that like your, this is how it works, period? I think that this theory has to be credited to Ayn Rand. She talked about this in her theory of objectivist epistemology. There were other thinkers. There have been other thinkers throughout history that have said something like this. John Locke, for instance, had a theory of abstraction, wasn't quite as, as worked out as Rand's and, and really went astray in, in many places and, and ultimately was unworkable and led to some of the uh, worst developments in uh, Enlightenment era philosophy. Uh, Thomas Reed is another who was like Locke. He was uh, an empiricist or fell into what we now call the empiricist school of philosophy. And he had ideas like this as well, that we abstract. Um, and even going all the way back to Aristotle, Aristotle had some notions that were similar to those that Rand later developed. But uh, this is, as far as I know, in its fully worked out form, is uh, the achievement of one and only one philosopher. Of course, she uh, worked off of insights from prior philosophers, but this was Rand's achievement, and she considered this one of her most important contributions to philosophy was her theory of concepts. Because if our concepts are not legitimate, if they are not based in reality, as many say, then none of our knowledge is. We hold our knowledge conceptually. And so if we can't claim any objectivist basis, any objective basis for our concepts, then we have no objective basis for our knowledge, and we're in the same boat as the many warring camps on the issue of truth that we talked about earlier. Interesting. So do you think that following this, that if somebody thinks that something is morally, or not morally, but actually subjective, then the problem lies within one of the concepts that they hold to be, well, one of the concepts that everything is, is founded upon? Um, let me rephrase the question, see if I understand it. So you're asking if somebody has a belief that is subjective, does it ultimately, uh, does, does this ultimately stem from a conceptual issue? Is that right? I see. Um, I think that that is a bit hard to answer without an example on the table. Um, 
I'm not certain that it is. I think that we would be jumping to conclusions too quickly to say that every lapse into subjectivism is the result of a, a unclear or false concept. Um, although it's possible that you could you could reason your way through such issues and say, well, ultimately this comes from a false concept. But I'm not sure that that's the way that the person who was coming to that subjective belief would really come come to it at, uh, through. I think I'm I'm realizing a lot whenever as I've gotten into to to podcasting and just like having these conversations, how much more clear I need to be in terms of my, um, first off, in terms of my thought processes, second, in terms of the words that I use. And, and it will, it'll come through throughout time, but it's kind of like a, um, it's, it's a refinement process for sure. Yeah. Well, if I could give any advice to you or your listeners on that, and I know you're already taking this, it's doing writing on a regular basis write on a regular basis. This is the means writing enables you to see your thoughts on the page and then reflect on those thoughts. It's very easy for a thought to come and go. And, and when that happens, we don't have time to duly reflect on it and figure out what is true, what is false, how to more clearly state what we think. And so if you write, you can reflect on your thinking and clarify it over time. And even if you're just doing a journal if you're writing for publication, whatever it may be, I think everyone who writes on a regular basis will just see a massive improvement in the clarity of their thinking. One tip I would give and, uh, and, and just shameless self-promotion here is to take the writing seminar that I just uh, organized. I brought together some of the greatest writers in the liberty movement, Timothy Sandifer, Virginia Postrel, John Miltimore, Deborah Lefetra, and Donna Matias, we're going to be teaching this course, this seminar, uh, which is Six Perspectives on Writing in Defense of Liberty. And so you'll hear each of those people give their thoughts on good writing. I'm sure that uh, these are all pros. They're going to have some similarities and some differences. And just in general, this type of writing advice, writing advice tends to be general enough to apply in lots of spheres. So if you're not particularly interested in promoting the cause of liberty, you might still gain a lot of really valuable writing tips from taking the course. So I'd recommend that. And um, you can check that out at objectivestandard.org. And it's under our courses, or you can just type into Google something like six perspectives on writing in defense of liberty, and you'll probably pull it right up. Uh, another one is read a lot and write a lot. And um, I think the more good writers you read, the, the more you get to understand what good writing is and sort of develop your own standards for, for what you think is good writing. And when you have your own standards for what you think is good writing, and those standards actually line up with what readers want to read, then I think you can become a really, really powerful writer. To do that, you can take courses like the one I mentioned. Um, you might also read books on writing like On Writing Well by William Zinsser is one of the best. And I would also recommend Ayn Rand's The Art of Nonfiction, an amazing book on writing. I love On Writing Well. Yeah, it's great. It is, it is a fantastic read. Okay, let's jump into these rapid fires. So first, what do you value in life? Well, I think first and foremost, I value life itself. Life is the root of all other values. And uh, if you don't stay alive, then you can't really think about thriving. So um, because I value life, I value the conditions on which life is made possible. And that would be freedom. I highly value freedom because freedom is absolutely necessary to live a good life and even just to live. And I value lots of things uh, that you, that you might suspect, like food and uh, great art and making music. I love making music. I'm uh, recording this in my recording studio that is not a podcasting studio. It's a music recording studio. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, uh, I love the, the values that make my life great and possible. That wasn't very rapid. I'll try to get faster, especially as I'm running out of time. <laughs> No, you're good. Okay, what is a good life? Well, I think that the in the ge most general conception, 
A good life is the life of flourishing, and that requires not only just meeting the basic requirements of survival, but also achieving life-serving values that you care about. I like that. Okay, and lastly, if you could only leave one piece of advice for the world and generations below you, what would you say? I would say follow reason. Everything else is a consequence of that. Use your reason and uh, nature to be commanded must be obeyed, to quote Francis Bacon again. (laughs) I love that. Okay. Well, thank you so much, John, for coming on. I really appreciated it. Um, I, I really hope that we can have another conversation. Um, also I am, I'm pretty interested in taking your writing class. So I would just go to objective standard. Yeah. If you go to objective standard.org and go to the courses menu, You'll see it there, and I'll just say for your benefit and for anyone else's who is hearing this, uh, we offer full scholarships for people that are 29 and younger, and um, you just apply. You've got to answer some questions and basically qualify for it, and if you do, you can take the course for free. Love. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, John, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me on, and I look forward to more conversations down the road. I hope that you found this this episode enriching. I would love to hear your thoughts. If you would like to write a rating or a review, that would be fantastic. You can also follow me at Daniel Podcast. I'm looking forward to our next episode. Cheers.